Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you are watching this video, I am I'm happy to have you. Welcome to Bible study, uh, at least what Bible study looks like right now here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I'm Vicar, in case you are watching this and you haven't consistently been at studies or what have you. Um, this is going to be a study on Revelation 14. If you are in the wrong place and you are looking to start a little bit earlier in Revelation, those videos are available on the same YouTube page that published this video. Um, right as of this recording, we have Revelation 1, 12, and 13 up. And as I go forward, I'll be filling in that gap because we did all of those first studies in person. Um, and now, obviously, we're switching to video studies for a little bit. So with that, we're going to move into Revelation 14. Um, just to remind you a little bit of where we're coming from. In 13, we're coming from these two beasts uh, coming up and afflicting the earth, whether they would be um, kind of, we take them often as, as metaphors for the social, the political, the economic systems in the world that try and draw the faithful away from God, that draw people away from God. But then also how forces within the church can work to build up those other entities that pull people away from God. And in that way, how the church can be a little self-destructive. So um, if you are interested in that discussion, those, those comment threads are available below the other video. And I would encourage you to go back, get involved with that. But... That's where we're coming from as we go into Revelation 14. So we're going to start in Revelation 14 verses 1 through 5. Go ahead and take your Bibles out, whether that be a physical Bible or pulling it up on your phone. Um, whatever the case may be, I will also have the text up here on the screen for you. So Revelation 14, starting at the first verse. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. And with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name, and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the one thousand four hundred, one hundred and forty-four thousand. sorry, who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So this, this vision of Mount Zion, it reflects a previous scene all the way back in Revelation 5. So there's, there's this continuity of these, these faithful worshipers of God being before him. Um, and kind of this, this story, this Mount, in reality, Mount Zion and the Lamb, this, where we start this chapter, this has been a, a place and a symbol that has long been associated with deliverance. So what this is signaling is the beginning of the end. This appearance on Mount Zion, this, this return of God, this, the Lamb appearing, all of this is kind of the signal of the end of the war that has been talked about for the, the past several chapters. Because if you'll recall, these past couple chapters kind of step out of the timeline of the rest of Revelation, and they go over everything. Uh, everything we've read, in fact, the entirety of Scripture, because we see events that happen even before Genesis. The, the fall of Satan, the war in heaven. Um, and then we see kind of it jumps forward to the birth of Christ and the, the life and death and victory of Christ. And now it's kind of it's starting to point toward the end of time. Um, so that's kind of where we are in this timeline. And we go forward and it talks about these 100 or 1, 144,000 numbers apparently are hard this morning um and those who had been redeemed from the earth uh those who had his name the father's name um this is after the war with the dragon so if you look back into 12 and 13 we, we see this conflict between 
God and Satan, where Satan attacks the church. So this is the church marching in victory after uh, that, even after having been conquered in earthly warfare. Even after the church suffers on, on the earth. Um, now, uh, and I'm going to tell you, this is the second and the last time that the 144,000 are referenced. And this, this victorious church is referenced. And it says, um, a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and the sound of loud thunder. It was like harpists playing on their harps and they were singing a new song. Um, so this is the church triumphant. Singing a new song of praise to God. It is loud. It is powerful. It is beautiful. You get that, the roar of many waters, the sound of thunder, the sound of harps. It's, it's loud. It's excited. It's beautiful. It's all of these incredible things. Um, but it says that no one could learn this except those who are bought with the blood of the Lamb. Um, what this is kind of saying almost seems a little obvious because it's saying that only the faithful can praise the Lamb. Which kind of is like a duh thing. Like, obviously, if you're not faithful to God, you're not going to be praising him. Um, because, well, you may not believe in him. You don't believe in him. So you're not going to praise something you don't believe in. But also there's this aspect of at this point in the timeline of the world, the unfaithful are going through punishment. Uh, so there is that... Uh, what this speaks to, though, is a unified church in eternity. It's saying kind of everybody's brought to the same place and the same understanding and that same relationship with God. Um, so that's something that's kind of cool that it's speaking to. Um, and as we go forward, it says, It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Um, now, I don't want to misread this. And, and like I speak to frequently when we talk about Revelation, I, I don't know if this is literal or symbolic. Maybe the choir that is, is directly serving God is literally uh, made up of virgins. I don't think that's the case, though. Because it, it, Scripture often portrays the church as a bride. So when, when it speaks to symbolically this, this bride as a virgin before Christ... It's speaking more to idolatry, more to worshiping false gods as this defilement than literal, actual sexual relations. So as we speak to this, as it says, those who have not defiled themselves with women, um, this could be literal. I, I don't want to rule that out because it could be. But I think there's a lot of evidence that it's, it's more they have a genuine and a pure faith in Christ that is undefiled by idolatry and false gods. Um, so that's hopefully a little bit of a clarification there um, and, and makes that a little more, I guess, comprehensible for us. And then it goes forward. They, it is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes, which falls in line more with the, uh, these are those who have not given into idolatry kind of thing because they're faithfully following Christ. And it kind of connects with that. Um, it, and it says, these are those who have been redeemed uh, from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. Um, so they've been, I want to talk about this word redeemed a little bit for a second, because I think it's a church word that gets used a lot that isn't necessarily connected really well with our, our lived experience, with our comprehension. Um, so redemption has a couple different connotations that I think are really useful. A couple different understandings. The one is like you redeem a coupon or you you pay for something. Um, so when it says these have been redeemed from mankind, they have been paid for by Christ. They are now his. He has taken ownership of them. So that's one way kind of we understand redeem as this almost purchasing language. But then there's also this... Um, you redeem someone as you bring them up from a lower state. So uh, you redeem someone, you bring them back into honor, you bring them back into glory or whatever the case may be, which is also really cool because this is talking about how Jesus is bringing his people back into honor, back into the presence of the glory of God. So, um, and it's talking about them as the first fruits. So this 
language is frequently used when we talk about sacrifices to God. We give him our first fruits. That's the, the first of the crop. We give to him before we take care of anything else. So with that kind of in mind, this is speaking to these saints as an offering to God for the sake of Christ's mission. So maybe uh, this these redeemed are, are living sacrifices. And maybe that's what heaven looks like, our, our entire eternity as a living sacrifice to God, which is how it's talked about frequently. And I think that's actually a really cool thing to look forward to. Um, so with that kind of whole discussion in mind about being redeemed, uh, my, my question for you, and this is going to be below, so I would encourage you to, to please weigh in on this conversation and, and see what other people think and, and put in your own opinions and ideas as well. What, is, what do you think it means to be redeemed from mankind? Like in, in, in our daily lives and how we live on a regular basis, what does it look like to be redeemed, to be purchased, uh, to be lifted up from mankind, away from mankind? What does that difference look like? So, so please engage in that comment below. I, I look forward to seeing what you have to say and what you think. Um, we are going to move forward, though, and it says... Uh, in, in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. So this, this again, is more to their, their speaking faithfully, especially regarding God. Um, and it's a contrast because we, we talk about the devil frequently as the sponsor of all lies. So, and, and all of this is, you know, this is purity through the blood of the Lamb. Um So with that, we are going to move forward into Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And it says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to pro proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So this is a somber message of judgment, which is not typically what we associate with the word gospel, with this eternal gospel, this because gospel, the, the word that it comes from, literally translated, just means good news. Um, but what this, the reason that this is good news, the reason that this is gospel is that it moves people to worship God as the creator of all life. This is an invitation and a call for worship. So there, there's not a lot to get into in these couple verses because it is really simply just that. But the, the response, the comment that I have below for you is, um, what does it look like to give God glory? What, what does that actually look like? Um, we, we have this call to praise that we can heed even here and now. So what does that look like? Especially in the midst of this social distancing and uh, the stay home orders and the, the coronavirus. What, what does it look like today to get into glorifying God? So moving forward from that, we have Revelation 14 verse 8. Another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Um, <coughs> so, what I want to put forward with this is, this isn't necessarily talking about a literal nation. Babylon, the historical nation, um, it's, it's not speaking literally of Babylon the Great being fallen. This is speaking to the evil enemies of God's people on earth. And Babylon is frequently used symbolically as kind of a type, as a placeholder for the enemies of God's people. And what this is really interesting is that it is symbolic of both of the beasts we talked about last week in Revelation 13 presented as one. So when it's talking about the, the great enemy being fallen, Babylon the great being fallen, this is talking about the enemies of God's people are fallen. So 
He goes forward, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So I, I want to refer back to that earlier discussion as sexual immorality frequently being symbolic of idolatry and not faithfully following God. So the church is then a faithful bride in that, and idolatry is adultery. So when it's speaking to the enemies of the church who led the nations into idolatry, that has fallen. They have fallen in this final time. So from there we move into Revelation 14 verse 9. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. So this verse that we uh, are looking at, I think is, is tough. Because as we look at it, it's, it's talking about the reality um, of those who worship the beast, those who are outside the faithful who worship the church or who worship God in the church. Um, it's talking about their condemnation. And this is a truth that we believe. And this includes those outside the church. This also includes the false Christianity of the second beast from Revelation 13. Um, and this is a promise of, of eternal suffering, of anger not tempered by any mercy at all. And that's really tough because we are a people of grace. We are a people of mercy. And that's what we speak to. But this is, this is where the, like, this is the end. There's mercy, there's mercy, there's mercy, and then there comes a point where it is, it is done. And you are either in Christ or you are outside of Christ. And outside of Christ, this is what is being promised. A, an eternal tor torment, it says, and the smoke of their tor torment goes up forever and ever. There is no end to it. And this is a redemptive victory of God. Um... But part of that is the, the eternal suffering of those outside the faith. And that's really uncomfortable to talk about. And especially if you are like me and you have friends who, who are outside of the church, who are outside the faith, because they're included in this. And for us, I think that is an encouragement to go out and to share the gospel and to be, be the light of Christ in the world and to bring people to kneel before his throne. Um, but that's what we're seeing here is, is a picture of what it looks like to be outside of Christ. And that's contrasted with this song of praise that we just saw of those who are in Christ, of those who are saved. So that's where we're left as we go through Revelation 14, 9 and 11. And then we go into verses 12 and 13 and it says, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Um, this is a call for endurance. There, there is still conflict in the world. Um, and this is kind of I, it's stepping out of the narrative a little bit to, to talk to people who are reading this, who are hearing this. And this is a call for endurance, to hold on to the faith. Even in the midst of, of warfare, whether that be literal warfare or, or cultural warfare or um, conflict and strife that we feel in this world, um, we're supposed to hold on. Hold on to that, this promise that we have of eternal life. So uh, a reflection for you, this isn't going to be a comment down below because this is for you to consider. Um, how do you endure how do you hold fast to the promise that we have of eternal life in Christ? Even in the midst of, of struggles with people, maybe struggle with this environment that we're in now, this, this pandemic, through all of the various things that you have to face in your life, how can the hope of Christ get you through those? I want you to take a couple seconds 
and just reflect on that. So pause the video for 15, 20 seconds, think about it, and then resume. And as we resume, we're going to go to Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. No, verses 14 through 16. And it says, And then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe, so he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. And this is Jesus. This is Jesus on the cloud, coming in final victory. This is a white cloud of righteousness and glory, as opposed to a gray cloud that kind of would keep him hidden. Um, and then he's wearing a golden crown, and the symbol of that is victory. It is a, a untarnished, perfect victory. And it says that he, he holds a sharp sickle. Um, this is for separation and judgment. This is for the harvest. And this is speaking metaphorically. Um, and we're getting, getting, going to get into what that metaphor is going forward a little bit. But I, first I want to talk about this angel who's coming out of the temple and saying, Go and reap. Um, this is a messenger from the Father to the Son, and this could be very simply for the benefit of John and for us who are witnessing this, who are reading about this, who are hearing about this. Um, the angel is not commanding the Son. The, the angel is conveying the message from the Father to the Son, maybe for our benefit. Um, and this begins the harvest. So he casts his sickle on the earth, and here's how we're, we're or here's when we're going to talk about that metaphor a little bit of putting your sickle and reap for the hour is come, the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. This is an execution of the judgment of God. This is bringing into heaven, bringing into God's presence the faithful. And as we go through the Gospels, as we go through the New Testament, this is spoken of in this way again and again of the harvest, bringing in the harvest is bringing the faithful to God. And uh, frequently, Christ speaks about the end times as, as the wheat being brought to God and the chaff being sent to fire. So that's kind of the judgment that is being made here. So my question for you is, how do we prepare for the harvest? In, in, in the Gospels, we're called as workers into the field to prepare for the harvest. How do we prepare for this harvest? How do we prepare for the final judgment, both for ourselves and for the people around us? And that that's a, a discussion thread below. I would encourage you engage with that. Pause the video for a couple seconds, engage with that, and then come back. And as we come back, we're going to go into this final chunk of text from Revelation 14. Uh, starting at verse 17, it says, Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called out with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and, its, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. So what we, we just came from in the previous couple verses was Jesus gathering his faithful. And this is the other side. This is judgment. This is condemnation. Um, we're, we're talking about the angel who, who commands the, the harvesting angel, the one who comes out of the altar here in verse 18. That's the angel who's been listening to the pleas of the saints, who have said, How long, Lord, until you take vengeance for your people? Um, so this is an answering to the prayers. This The angel calling out the command could be the one who's listening to those prayers because the prayers of God's martyrs are being answered. And the unfaithful, the evil, the enemies of God's people are being cast out, are being trampled. And what's really interesting is the choice of metaphor is the trampling of a wine press. So um, 
If you are an expert in wine presses and wine making, my apologies if any of this is incorrect. But as far as I understand it, how the wine press works is you put a bunch of grapes in a bucket, essentially, a glorified bucket, and you try, like you trot on them, you walk on them, you press them to get all the juice out. And then the juice kind of leaks out and they do all of the wine making things to it. Um, but that's the image it's going for is the unfaithful are being trodden upon by God's wrath. And what's really interesting is earlier in Revelation, it talks about the holy city being trampled by those outside the church, by, by God's enemies. So those outside the city who trampled the city are now being symbolically, they're being put back out of the city. And those pagan nations, those, those people outside the church who once did the trampling are now being trampled. And it concludes with this really gory image um, of blood flowing out of the wine press. These people are being trampled. And it says, as high as a horse's bridle. So that is several feet high for 1,600 stadia. The, that is roughly the equivalent of, of 184 square miles. So that this is a huge tragedy. This is a gory, devastating scene for those who are outside the church, which again, calls us to reach out to those people, to bring them into Christ's family. Um, and you may ask, why the number 1,600? Uh, there is this aspect of completeness and totality because it's a square of squares. But <clears throat> I think what's important is that it's a big number. And it's a terrifying reality that is going to happen. So that is where we close Revelation 14. This is a dark chapter. This is this is the judgment. We, we have very spar uh, stark is the word I was looking for. A very stark contrast between the glory and the joy of praising God and being in his faithful. Along with the torment that is that is waiting for those who are outside of him. So that's the contrast that we see here, and I think what that does for us as Christians is it calls us into mission. It calls us to reach out to our neighbors. So that is where we're going to leave it, Revelation 14. I hope this has been helpful. We will release Revelation 15 next week at this time. And as far as the past chapters of Revelation, we will be releasing those throughout the week. Um, so with that, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.